Recipe for happiness. Yeah. Open, uh, open my mind and my heart. And in Manitoba, we hunt for buried treasure and find it. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, you're welcome, Holly. You're welcome. We're on the move. We're on the go. We're on the road again. Looking for these, Sonny? My keys. Yeah, that's why they call me Digger Joe. Well, thank you, Digger Joe. There's a loot for last weekend, fellas. Look at it. You got all that stuff for one day? Oh, that's two afternoons digging there. Get that spoon there. That spoon was there, too, along with these rings, these coins here, just as you see them right here. His real name is Joe Cutcher. But to his buddies, and a lot of other people he's helped in Winnipeg, he's Digger Joe. The glasses were in the water, and I happened to pick them out of there and dig them out. Yeah, they're they're nothing fair. Yeah, but I think we can find the owner to that. When Joe retired 15 years ago, he decided to take up a hobby, treasure hunting. It glitters, but I have my doubts that it's gold. <laughs> now at 81, that hobby has taken over his life. There's no dull moment. I'm more active now than I was when I was working. <laughs> Any day of the week, and you'll find Digger Joe scouring the city's playgrounds and boulevards, beeping for buried treasure. A spot like this is where the mothers and the fathers bring their kids. The mothers that lose the rings and the fathers lose the coins. Good sound right there. With the help of his trusty metal detector, Joe unearths all sorts of things. If you hear something that's in the ground, your curiosity's got the best of you, so you dig it up. Sometimes you find some good stuff. Gold, diamond rings. And if you find treasure, well, so much the better. Lots of times you only find junk. But even if it's a pull tab, well, you got something. One million of these gets a child a wheelchair. So that's what we do. So that goes into one side of the goodie bag. Anytime I've gone out, I've never ended up being skunk. I've always get something. Every now and then, that something is something valuable. And whenever Joe digs up treasure like this, that's when the real digging begins. All right, I find a ring. Say a 10-carat gold ring. That ring is no good to me. What am I going to do with it? You can't sell it because you get nothing for it. But if I can find, I mean, the person that owns it, and a thank you note or two that you get, I mean, like something like these here. You I get mean, lots of these, too, well, don't not you? not too many, but I get a few. Digger Joe, I just wanted once again to tell you how thankful I am for finding the ring that was most important to me. That's lovely. That's enough for you. You you don't want much more than a thank you no, and no, seeing, no, no. seeing the joy in somebody's face. Yeah. I get the pleasure of going out there doing it. And if I get lucky and find something for somebody else, well, okay. I couldn't believe it. He's a rare type of person, I guess. When Holly Peterson yeah, lost her school yeah, ring, yeah, she didn't think she'd ever see it again. She didn't even know she'd lost it at the local park. Luckily, it was one of Joe's regular hunting grounds. Well, I was down in that ground maybe a month or so after that, and I found this ring. But in this ring, it had her initials. It had the school that she was attending. It had the class that she was in and everything else. So I thought, well, that's not going to be too hard, I mean, to find this person. You're a bit of a detective. <laughs> There's that element, too, isn't there? Well, I try to, yeah, you've got to be a little bit, I mean, to try to find the owner. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, you're welcome, Holly, you're welcome. Mm. It is my pleasure to give it to you. Is yeah. this uh, an all-consuming kind of passion, Joe? Uh, to a certain extent, yes. Once you start in, it kind of grabs you. I mean, it's an addiction, I, to a certain extent. You, you lose track of time when you're out here. Sometimes you end up with a uh, 
cold shoulder and a hot tongue for supper because you're two hours late. Not too often, but once in a while. <laughs> Over the years, Joe's amassed a small fortune and a huge collection of loot. A lot of what he digs up is finders keepers, like his prized 1837 Quebec halfpenny. The stuff he doesn't want, he gives away to charity. And all the while, he's playing Sherlock Holmes. His latest case, to find the owners of three rings, including this one. It's the uh, embossed sort of raised letters around the stone that's on the ring, professional truck driver. I've uh, asked different people and everything else, I mean, that who nobody seems to know anything at all about these rings. I mean, that nobody knew of them at all. You're determined to return the truck I would sure like to return the whole three of them back. Joe Cutcher will go to any depth to dig up buried treasure, and if possible, dig up who it belongs to. Whether it's on the beach or the local playground, he just keeps on hunting, never knowing what the next beat will bring. Please. Please. Oh. Boyer! Looney! You know, these boots have been with me on the road for 10 years now, and the inevitable has finally happened, a tear in the leather. But luckily for me, this is Moncton, New Brunswick. There is a shoemaker in this city who people have been going to for almost 30 years now, and for good reason. Not only will he fix your boots, he'll throw in a little Italian opera to boot. Glue and nails can keep a shoe together. Music, especially opera music, does the same thing for the heart and soul of Bruno Caracristi. Well, opera, for me, is very important. Because it opened my mind and my heart. You know? Thank you, Alfred. Thank you. all the spirit to keep going. The story of Bruno and Carla Caracristi could itself be out of an opera. Half a century ago, half a world away, they grew up in a little town in northern Italy and fell in love when they were still teenagers. Long before shoemaking, Bruno and Carla worked together at a local pasta factory. Carla start 8 o'clock in the morning, I start 9 o'clock. Spaghetti. Spaghetti. Carla made spaghetti, I made lasagna. No lasagna, it's different. Fettuccini. Soon sopra. No. Were you singing back then, Bruno? Well, yes. Yes. Everywhere. Everybody know Bruno. Certainly everybody knew that Bruno could sing. But the manager at the pasta factory believed Bruno had the potential to sing professionally. So he find me the teacher. Teach me the music. But I said, no, I don't like go the music. Why? He said, no, I like go for my I like, I like Mary, Carla. And I like Mary. You gave up a singing career for the love of this woman. That's right. <laughs> but I enjoyed this way. In 1952, Bruno asked Carla to marry him. They started a family and set out to make a career in shoemaking. That pursuit took them halfway around the world and eventually brought them here to a little shop of their own in Moncton, New Brunswick. Of course, they brought a little bit of Italy with them, and that's something Bruno and Carla's son, John, who now manages the shop, has just had to get used to. It used to be somewhat embarrassing. Um, it is different. Not too many people have a shop and they'll sing their heart's content. But, uh, like, we're used to it. So now we don't pay too much attention to it. 
shop. Are there customers in the shop when you sing? Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, you Sometimes. don't mind that? Oh, no, no. Ritorna tutti gli anni, sempre alla stessa data, monti e mari e cavalca per In the 27 years you've been here, how many pairs of shoes have you repaired, Bruno? <laughs> Oh, thousand, thousand. <laughs> thousand, thousand. Yeah. Yes, you have nice shoes there, but you need more shoe polish. No way too long because you lose the shoes. Okay, you the same. Yeah, the Canadian people are very nice for me. Hmm? Oh boy, nice shoes. Where you come from? From England or Italy? From England. Oh, very nice. You made very good shoes too. Hello, how are you? Hello, gentlemen, how are you? Sometimes I stop, I say, look, you need something to repair. You know, come, come in my store, come in my shop, I give you good deal. No problem. Oh, I'm not scared to tell the people, you know, you need something. Okay, see okay. you tomorrow. Okay. okay. The customer tell me, oh, you made a nice job, so I'm more, more happy. No. <laughs> yes, we help you? Wow. Well, on the corner. In the corner, no, no quite finished. He's too busy now, and okay. uh, everybody... Well, I can come back, that's no All problem. right, no, no problem for you? But could I have a song this morning? Oh, sole mio, stai fronte a te. A couple of Bruno's songs okay. are up and you. bright, which much. is nice. Right. Yes, sir. Because, as it turns oh, out, no, most of what he sings is, well, downright depressing. Negli occhi tuoi spunto. You know what this means? La furtiva lacrima? A lacrima, you know, when a lacrima, I mean a cry. Okay. So the people, when they cry, after... most of the opera, 99% is tragic. Finish, everybody die or whatever. Die, die. but they lost, you know, they had the boyfriend or the girlfriend. So what is the great attraction then? Is that, is that it, because everybody dies? No, having a beautiful story. It's a story. Having a beautiful story. Who knows? If he'd taken the advice of the manager at the pasta factory, Bruno Caracristi might have become a professional tenor in Italy. But Bruno fell in love with Carla, took up shoemaking, and moved to Canada. And if this were opera, it would be that rarest of things, a happy opera. <laughs> story brings us to Logie Bay, Newfoundland, to meet two men, one who originally came from Montreal, the other who came from across the ocean, from Bulgaria. Theirs is the story of an incredibly strong relationship, a friendship forged in a foundry. <laughs> Anywhere between 2030 and 2050. It's a chilly morning in Logie Bay, Newfoundland. Okay. That's great. Okay. Five days. But for sculptor Lubin Boykov and his close friend, John Evans... Go to work. Okay. It's hot and getting hotter. Inside their greenhouse, there's an unusual combination. Flourishing plant life and an industrial foundry. Yeah. You ready? Ready, yeah. Let's go. Okay, let's okay. go. Okay. This is where John and Lubin prepare for the most crucial moment of their day. Let's go. Pouring molten bronze for a new yeah. sculpture. Pouring of the metal. Oh, such an exciting thing. I, I wouldn't give it up for a for the world. That's enough? Enough? Okay, hold it now. Let me get the... Just hold it so it doesn't twist. John has a, a term for it. <laughs> I call it skydiving for geriatrics. Okay, alphabet? Well, there's a lot of tension. Oh, okay, we're going. You know, it's like getting up in the in the airplane and you're jumping out and you're 
You're coming down and... Gently. When you land on the ground is when you finish that part. Woo! You know, that's just a release. It's just wonderful. Woo! That's yeah. it. Okay, down. Lubin and John have okay. known each other yeah. since 1990. Yep. Yeah. That's the year Lubin, an artist from Bulgaria, defected to Canada. A few weeks ago, we told you about a problem at Newfoundland's Gander Airport. Gander has become a popular stop for people who want to claim refugee status. From Bulgaria. For most of the refugees, defecting was a simple matter. As their planes refueled, they just walked off. But for Lubin, his wife Elena, and their two-year-old daughter, it was a nightmare. So we were not allowed to leave the plane, so we engaged into a fist fight with them. Uh, who tried to stop you on board? Oh, everybody, the, the stewardesses, the, the pilots, uh, the flight attendants, everyone. Like they were pulling my uh, two-year-old daughter out of my wife's hands, and uh, it was just, just unbelievable. While Lubin was fighting for freedom, John's life was also changing. For 25 years, he'd been a biology professor at Newfoundland's Memorial University. I was interested in environmental biology, and the thing that it taught me was that most of our environmental problems are caused by science. So I was getting alienated from my own profession as a scientist. John decided he wanted to get involved in the arts. Okay, can you hold it? I'll hold it. You look at it. Okay. He'd heard about the Bulgarian okay, refugees who were now That's living right, in Newfoundland. Yeah. Okay, hold it there. Many of them were artists. So in 1990, John organized a show for them, and that's when he first met Lubin. Okay, that's good. I was introduced to this tall, kind of grim-looking fellow. And tilted forward a bit. And uh, I said, uh, how would you like a little bit of money to buy some materials to do sculpture? And he said to me, are you crazy? I said, yes, I'm a little bit crazy. And big smile, he said, okay, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. And so the unlikely partnership between the artist and the scientist took root. There's a, a story that comes out of India that if you see a man in the water and you throw him a rope and pull him in and save him, you're responsible for him for the rest of your life. Now, I'm stuck with him. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's a, nice, a nice guy to be stuck with, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> Both men gained a lot from the relationship. Okay. Let, let this one go. No, 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 just keep going, keep going. Well, I know if you keep going, I have to remove this piece first. See? John had a chance oh, to God, learn God. about the process of bronze sculpting, and Lubin had a much needed benefactor. All they needed now was a foundry. Lubin is moaning, and he said, you know, I'm a sculptor, and I like to work in bronze, and I can't work in bronze because I don't have a foundry. Okay, well, let's build a foundry. A Lubin. dance version. <laughs> you have a different says, one? Says, Don't be so stupid, John. You can't build a foundry. That's impossible. That was the, <laughs> that was the moment that I decided, okay, this is going to be done. Nothing will stop me. So with John's scientific and technical wisdom, combined with Lubin's experience of foundry work, they decided to build their own in a greenhouse. All through my career, I've been trying to develop technologies which don't offend the, the uh, environment. It is a real challenge because foundries are usually smoky and dirty and full of grime and dust. And uh, as you can I tell... I see no, no dust on the leaves of these plants. I well, if plants are surviving uh, five feet away from, from the nail furnace, uh, yeah, it's magical. Okay, that's good. As the foundry grew, so did their friendship. Okay, Not that there weren't some stormy no, moments. Okay, now you go on the other side now. He nagged me. Nag oh, he nagged me. He nagged me and boxed me. <laughs> you, you wanted about in that position? Yeah. Okay, can you hold that? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Do you actually yell at each other? Oh, yeah. Two people with okay. huge egos are bound to clash every now and then. That looks pretty good, Ra. Okay. We go like two bulls. Boom! Like that. Roar and scream and yell. And then back off and think about it a while. So have you chosen a couple? I mean, are you just bringing no, in the one? just the one. No one knows better about the relationship between John and Lubin than their wives, 
Margot, and the Lemon. Like to go for a walk up in the woods and relax. Sure. Uh, how about you? Let's go. Uh, what do you think? I know about staying in the garden. I think we'll stay and have a little walk. Having a chat. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Their relationship is so strong. They get so angry at each other and yell at each other and scream at each other and they feel totally safe to do that. Oh, why, 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 why? It is something very special. It is. You should cut this one down, John. You can feel the yeah. love and behind the, the yell right. and the scream. They always <laughs> end up with hugs and they're, they're, they have a very strong, very unique, very unique relationship. relationship. Come on, doggies. For John Evans and Lubin Boykov, meeting each other has meant more than just becoming close friends. It's given each man a new direction in life and the means to create some beautiful art. Lubin's sculpture are his creation, they're his children. And I was participant in giving the world this lasting, beautiful things. Wow. Do you wake up some mornings just saying, I still can't believe it? No, well, I, I, don't, I don't have to wake up. I, I do that all day. I can't believe it. Yeah, how many times a day I keep saying that? Well, it's nice to have you in our country, well, in your country. Nice to be here yeah, in my country now. program for another week. Thank you so much for joining us. Next week, I hope you'll travel with us here to Nova Scotia. We're going to meet a blacksmith by the name of Lauren Fraser, who specializes in making bells. Oxen bells. Even when I was a kid, I wanted to make bells. It's just something about it, like a, uh, I always say, a kid opening up a present at Christmas time. When I break open that clay pot, I'm anxious to see what that bell is going to turn out like. Are they different than cowbells? Yeah, uh, a cowbell is an ox bell that didn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> the Bells of Mahone Bay, next week when we're on the road again. I'm Wayne Rosted. Hope to see you then. Good night from Nova Scotia. There you are, fellas. That's the yesterday's recording glue. Oh, Let me see those. Oh, oh. Hey, Digger Joe!